Thank you for coming out for the Ars Poetica reading. I'm Jennifer Adkison. I am a, a faculty in English writing, and I am here to introduce Molly Gloss, who's going to be reading from this wonderful book, The Hearts of Horses. Um, I'm so excited to have her here. I've, I've been a fan of hers for a number of years. And um, by way of introduction, I could talk about the awards that she has received, that she was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award for American Fiction. I could talk about her win of the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Award and the Oregon Book Award, all for the Jump Off Creek. Um, I could talk about the extensive research that she's done to write the book, The Hearts of Horses. Instead, I'd like to just share a little story with you that illustrates to me the authenticity of her work. When I finished reading The Hearts of Horses, I was so struck by the realistic depiction of Elwha County that I immediately went to my Oregon map to find it. Now, I'm not an Oregonian, you can probably tell from my voice, um, but I went to my Oregon map and I was looking, where is this place? I know it's got to be somewhere near La Grande. I couldn't find it. I went to MapQuest, still no Elwha County. So in my search, I came across a quote where Molly speaks of creating the fictional Elwha County in an interview. And she said, I just shoved aside some other counties in Oregon and plopped down Elwha where I wanted it to be, south of Pendleton and north of John Day, and pushed other things aside to make room for it here. This to me underscores the effect her novels have had on me, and I think that many of you will share this. You begin to believe in the places and the people that she writes about. From horsebreaker Martha Lesson, the young woman who is a, a fabulously well-drawn character who's both strong and vulnerable, to the writer Charlotte Bridger Drummond, who's both a writer and a mother who even in the midst of extraordinary circumstances, and if you've read Wildlife, you know what I'm talking about, she feels real. To homesteader Lydia Sanderson as she makes her way in the world of the Jump Off Creek, her characters feel like people you might know. Now my copy of Jump Off Creek, which was my initial introduction to Molly Gloss, on the cover it says, it's as authentic as sand in one's shoes. I love that quote because it really speaks to the physicality of Molly's authenticity. We feel the cold, we breathe the air, we mentally map the landscape. Now I've never broken a horse, I've never castrated a bull, surprisingly, but I don't have to now. <laughs> I don't have to do that because Molly creates characters and experiences that are compelling and authentic and viscerally true. So I'm pleased tonight to present to you Molly Gloss. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, David, for inviting me. Um, I haven't castrated a bull either. <laughs> you can find anything in research. <laughs> um, I'm not going to read to you from the hearts of horses. Um, for the last four years or so, I've been working on a new novel. Um, I'm coming very close to the end of it now. If I don't finish this damn book by the end of the year, you need to come and find me and cut my throat, I think, because <laughs> I'm really ready for this book to be done, but it isn't quite done yet. Um, and it is, in fact, a, boy, I hate that word, sequel. It is a companion to the hearts of horses. Um, it, it mostly concerns a young man who's 19 years old who's gone down in 1938, gone down to uh, Southern California to work in the movie industry um, as a stunt writer and wrangler in the cowboy movies that were so popular in the 1930s and 40s. So it's mostly about that. Um, but, but there is a whole section in the middle that concerns um, characters from the Hearts of Horses. Martha Lesson, whom Jennifer mentioned, and, and Henry Fraser. Um, so I thought I would read from that tonight, which is a little bit scary because the book isn't done yet. And I haven't um, shown much of this to, to many readers, hardly any readers, as a matter of fact. 
Um, so you're hearing something that feels um, raw to me a little bit. Um, and the scary thing about it is that I can always tell from the vibe in the room whether something's going over well or not. <laughs> so I, I hope it goes well. Let's see. We'll see. Um, anything else I need to say? I, I, it's probably, I don't know, 20, 20 minute uh, read and then I'm happy to answer questions about this work or any of my work at all. Happy to talk about writing. I, I suspect that some of you are writers yourselves. That's usually the case at readings and particularly at universities where writing students tend to come to these things. Um, this novel has a working title. Um, not sure this will be the, the final title, but it's the title I'm using at the present moment. It's Rough Cut. And this is a piece from that middle section that concerns Martha Lesson. And this would be about 19, well, the late 20s, this piece. Martha had bought, bought a dun Mustang, a coming two-year-old, from a band of wild horses that Arlo Gantz and his sons had run down and captured in the Ochico Forest. She had picked him out of the herd mostly because she liked the way he moved and the smart look in his eye and his good muscling. But also, without saying so to Henry or Arlo or to anybody, she thought he was just about the prettiest horse she had ever seen. She had been smitten by his long, wavy, dark mane and forelock standing out against the dun hide and his dark tail so long it dragged on the ground. Like a gypsy horse, she thought without really knowing what a gypsy horse would look like. She had heard people say that a Mustang was a dangerous animal, but she liked the idea of a horse coming to her unacquainted with human beings, a horse that hadn't already been ruined by anybody, a horse that hadn't developed any bad habits or expectations of being handled roughly. She knew if she ran into problems with him, there wouldn't be anybody to blame but herself. In the first days, he was spooked by just about anything she did, taking off her hat, adjusting the buckle on her chaps, almost anything. But he never came at her to kill her, like some horses she'd met, horses who'd been badly mistreated. It just took her a little while to persuade him she wasn't a bear or any other creature out to get him. And from that point on, he was willing and steady and reliable as any horse she had ever owned. She hadn't expected to keep him for the reason that Ochiko Mustangs ran small, and even at four years old, the dun barely made 14 hands. Martha herself was 5'11 and had always preferred to ride a big horse. But the little Mustang could pick his way through rocks and brush and badger holes, loose shale rock or steep bare places without stumbling. She didn't know if this was on account of his growing up wild or if it was just his nature but he was more sure-footed than any animal she had ever ridden, and his feet were so well-built and hard-wearing that he didn't need to be shod. By the time he was four, she was riding him just about every day and had given up the idea that she had to always sit on a tall horse. She named him Sugarfoot. This was in the early Depression years when she had begun trapping muskrat and coyote for the little bit of extra income. Her trap line was in the upper reaches of Eckel Creek, and on a Sunday in late October, she went up there very early to check the traps. Mary Claudine, who was eight years old and had just started third grade, went with her. Martha's children had both learned to ride on her old mare, Dolly, but after Dolly went blind in her right eye, Martha had retired her to pasture. So the day this all happened, Mary Claudine was riding a bay gelding called Tippy. Martha went on Sugarfoot, who by then was a six-year-old. It was a bright morning, the sky as blue as a robin's egg, just one big white cloud above the mountains to the north. In her own girlhood, Martha had been sober-minded, wary of her dad's doubled-up belt. But her daughter had had a different upbringing. She liked to ride bareback, acting the daredevil, and was a little too pleased with herself when it came to riding, which amused and vexed her parents. While Martha on the Mustang went up the Crick Trail at a walk, 
Mary Claudine hardly stayed in sight, but played at being an Indian girl on daring adventures, jumping tippy at a gallop over ditches and windfalls, dodging trees, racing him back and forth through the creek, so the splash made a big noise and sent all the birds flying up from the trees. Of course, Martha didn't want a horse galloping through where she was trying to check her traps, which the girl knew. So when they got up to the bench where the creek ran right through the middle of the open field and the first of the traps was set, she quit showing off. There was no snow on the ground, but it was a cold morning. There had been frost overnight, and the field was bright with sunlight. So she stretched out full length along Tippy's broad back and neck and let her arms hang down along his sides and closed her eyes. The sun pressed her face and the horse's steamy, fragrant heat rose up along her spine. Martha wore rubber boots to wade out in the water and check the traps. She left her horse standing along the bank and she stepped around some rocks into the creek and followed the chain out to the trap and then she was sitting in the creek, her hands slack, and the air was full of the smell of burning hair. She hadn't heard a sound or made one. She turned her head and saw that her horse was dead on the ground. Wisps of acrid smoke rose from his nostrils and from his dun hide. Mary Claudine? She wasn't sure if this name came from her mouth or was only inside her head. She could see Tippy a few yards off, bucking like crazy, and her daughter sitting on the ground with a vacant look. Mary Claudine, she said, though not as loud as she meant it to be. She stood up, but then she had to sit right down again in the shallow water. She waited another minute and then stood again slowly. Her overalls were soaked to the waist, dripping into her rubber boots. She stepped around her horse and walked across the blurred ground to Mary Claudine and sat down again. Tippy had stopped bucking and was standing there spraddle-legged, his sides heaving, his ears flattened all the way back. He gave Martha a baleful stare as if he thought she had done him a great disservice. Mary Claudine? She took hold of her daughter's chin and turned the girl's head and saw that her face did not look burnt and there weren't any burn marks on her clothes. The dreamy expression had already begun to leave her face. Did I get bucked off? It was lightning. Did, do you hurt anywhere? She put her hand on the top of her head. My head is sore. Martha's own head had begun to hurt, and her hands and feet prickled and stung in a worrying way. She moved Mary Claudine's hand and parted her hair to look at the scalp, which was maybe pinker than usual, but not blistered or scorched. When she had been about 14, Martha herself had been lying in bed watching out the window when lightning struck a big pine tree near the house, split the tree to the ground, and set it on fire. And then, when she and Henry were first married and still living in Elwha County, a boy they knew slightly, his father ran the hardware store in Bingham, had been killed by lightning. He was walking along with a hoe over his shoulder when lightning struck the hoe and killed the boy. Martha had several times seen a cow lying dead with brown scorch marks on its hide and heard stories about bunches of cattle or sheep killed by lightning. Lightning was something she was acquainted with. But lightning coming out of a clear blue sky hadn't made it onto her personal list of things that might kill one of her children or kill a horse she loved. Oh, Mary Claudine said, as if something had stung her, but it was only that she had looked over and seen Sugarfoot on the ground, his hind legs half in the crick and his long black tail floating out gently on the current. The girl took after her mother in her feeling toward animals. She had a soft spot for runty barn cats and crippled birds, baby mice, toads with ill-formed legs. She grieved every dead cow and calf. In the fall, when they weaned the calves, she hid in the barn and wept to hear the bawling of the bereft babies and their mamas. In eight years of life, she had never seen a horse lying dead on the ground. 
Is Sugarfoot killed, she said, in a rising wail and began to cry without waiting for the answer. Martha said, I don't know why we weren't killed too. She thought afterward that this was not something she should have said to a girl eight years old. But at the time, it only seemed like the wondering truth. They rode back to the house two astride, bareback on Tippy. His hide twitched in nervous spasms and his ears stayed pinned back and twice he startled at nothing they could see or hear. Just jumped sideways as if a big cat or a wolf had come after him suddenly. And if they hadn't had a balanced seat, they both would have landed on the ground. Martha's mind felt vague and cottony as if she was half asleep. She went over and over the words to tell Henry what had happened. But when they got home, he wasn't there to be told. In her woolly state, she had forgotten that he and Bud had gone up into the reserve to comb for any cows that had been missed in the roundup. She sent Mary Claudine inside to make some coffee, and she took Tippy to the barn and looked him over carefully for burn marks or any other signs of injury. She hardly ever kept a horse in the barn unless the horse was sick or foaling. But after she had rubbed him down, she put him in a box stall where she thought he would feel safer and could begin to recover his nerves. Then she went out to the pasture and she called Prince to her and led the big draft mule into the barn, plow harnessed him and rummaged around in the chain goods until she found a long, heavy piece of logging chain to use for a drag line and then brought the mule and the chain to the front of the house and went in and found Mary Claudine with her head resting on her arms on the kitchen table. Are you feeling sick? She touched the back of the girl's neck. I don't want Sugarfoot to be dead, muffled, spoken into the sleeves of her shirt. Martha tried to think how to answer. She wanted to sit with Mary Claudine, put her head down too, or both of them go up to bed and crawl under the covers. He didn't feel it, she said finally. It didn't hurt him at all. She stood looking down at the back of her daughter's head, her hair tangled with bits of duff and twig. She'd been riding like a hellion through the trees and the brush Martha remembered suddenly. After a minute, she poured herself some coffee and drank it, looking out the window. She didn't want to go back out to where Sugarfoot had died. She didn't want to have to see him dead. She set down the empty coffee cup and said, Mary Claudine, unless you're feeling sick, I want you to start some stew so it'll be ready by supper time. Bud was the only one who usually cooked for them all. Mary Claudine hadn't ever made stew without her brother standing over her, enjoining and criticizing. The girl lift her, lifted her head. She looked over at her mother and put her hand on her brow as if she was checking herself for fever. I don't feel sick. Well, good, there's some elk meat in the cellar. You go ahead and start the stew. So when Dad and Bud come in, they'll have something hot to eat. I have to go out and check on Tippy. He's in a stall in the barn. And then I have some chores to take care of, and I'll come back in later to see how you're doing and make sure you still feel all right. Mary Claudine jumped up and dragged a chair over so she could reach the stew pot on a shelf above the sink. Martha watched her a minute. And then she took off her rubber boots and put on her chore boots. Her overalls had almost dried already and the mud on them was stiff and scratchy, but she left them on and went back out to the barn and looked in on Tippy, who seemed to be only tired now, standing hip shot in the stall with his eyes half closed. And then she climbed on Prince, her legs clamped around the plow harness and rode him up the creek trail, holding a can of kerosene on her lap and the chain piece doubled up and draped across his withers. The blue sky had turned dark in the northwest and a wind had come up, thrashing the branches of the pine trees. It was the sort of wind that always signaled a change in the weather and maybe a little rain. Sometimes it also meant lightning. When they came to the place where Sugarfoot had died, the mule widened his nostrils, not liking the scent of ozone and burnt meat and death. So she left him standing four or five yards off and she went up to her horse 
and after a few moments squatted down next to him. There was a brown streak of burnt hair down his back, and his eye was pure white as the albumen of an egg, which made her think the lightning must have entered through his eye and traveled down his back. The soul that had made him a horse had already gone completely out of him. He was a stiff carcass only. A horse might live 25 years if well cared for. She had often thought of her life in terms of how many good horses she would love. Dolly, she knew, was her first, and she had begun to feel that Sugarfoot was her second. Sometimes, too, she had thought of heaven as the place where you met up with all the horses you ever loved. But it was hard to think of that now, with her dead horse lying on the ground in front of her. She unbuckled the cinch on the saddle and pushed it away from him as well as she could. The one fender and stirrup were pinned under his body, but she hoped when Prince dragged the carcass away from the crick, the saddle might come free. Sugarfoot was lying with his rear end partway in the water, and she stepped out on rocks not to get her feet wet again and looped an end of chain around his hind fetlocks. Then she stood and brought up the mule a bit closer. She had to talk to him and pet him before he agreed to come. She hooked the other end of the chain to the heel chain on the mule and then walked him out until the chain pulled tight around the fetlocks. Prince was a big half-Belgian. They had used him to drag dead cows and logs and stumps. She didn't know how much Sugarfoot weighed, maybe eight or 900 pounds, but she thought some logs the mule had dragged must have weighed at least that. She chirped to him and asked him to put his hindquarters into it. He scrabbled and dug his hooves into the soft ground of the stream bank. The chain rattled and then tautened and the mule moved ahead, his big muscles clenching, his neck bowed, and the dead horse began moving by inches. The carcass slowly twisted on the ground and the saddle twisted and was dragged along for a yard or two until the stirrup leather broke and then the saddle tipped up on its horn and came free and lay there in the mud smear and the horse's long coarse tail swept over it like a bead curtain as the mule went on pulling. When the carcass was 50 feet from the creek, Martha unhooked the heel chain and went back to unhook the drag chain from the horse. The lynx had bitten through the hair and hide, and the left cannon bone had broken, which she thought must have happened at the beginning when the carcass was twisting on the ground. The terrible angle of the leg and the fractured white bone poking through the hide started her crying. She remembered suddenly how Sugarfoot hadn't minded at all the first time she sat on his back. In fact, he had reached around and nuzzled her foot she remembered how it had moved her at the time, almost to tears, and it was a minute before she was able to stop crying. But then she loosened the links from the fetlocks, and she was able to pour out the kerosene over the horse and light it a fire and walk off a dozen yards before looking back. When the fire had died somewhat, she threw the muddy saddle pad and the saddle up on Prince over his plow harness and cinched it lightly to keep it there, but she didn't want to ride him that way with the saddle chafing against the harness. In any way, the saddle had one stirrup torn off. So she walked and led the mule, and it took an hour or better to get back home. It began to rain about halfway there, but not hard, and she heard thunder two or three times a long way off, but never saw lightning. By the time she got to the house, the storm had already moved down toward the Bailey Creek Valley in the southeast, which was the usual pattern for their weather, and not something she had given much thought to in the past, except in terms of rainfall. But now she hoped if there was lightning, it wouldn't kill any animals on those ranches and homesteads down on the flats. Henry and Bud had come back to the house ahead of her, and one of them had turned Tippy out in the pasture with the other mule, Mike. While Martha was in the barn stripping the tackle off Prince, Henry came out to help her and to ask about what had happened. Mary Claudine had told him a story about lightning and Sugarfoot, but he wanted to hear it from his wife. When she got to the part about the broken leg, 
She started to cry again, and he put an arm across her shoulders. Honey, that's just the way it is, he said, which was always his answer whenever an animal died. She turned away from him and went back to pull in the harness off Prince. That's not a bit of comfort, she said. It seemed to her that he didn't understand anything she was feeling. The horse had been a favorite of hers, and he thought her tears were about that. But he ought to know. She hadn't said it to herself in so many <coughs> words, but he ought to know. It could have been Mary Claudine struck dead by lightning, and he ought to know that her tears had as much to do with that as with a chain breaking a dead horse's leg. Henry watched her a minute and then reached around her and pulled the harness into his arms and carried it off without saying another word. She led Prince outside and turned him into the pasture and stood there watching him trot out to join his friends. After a minute, Henry came up next to her and they both watched the mule lie down and roll around on the ground and then stand again and shake himself off. Henry said, does your head hurt? Mary Claudine has got a red patch on the top of her head that might be going to blister. She was too drained to be brave. She laid her palm on her scalp. It's a little bit hot. The bottoms of my feet are hot too. He bent her head down so he could part her hair and look at the scalp for burns. I wonder if the bolt didn't go right through you from top to bottom, he said. Lucky it didn't kill you and Mary Claudine both. These words just about started her crying again, and he wasn't sure what to do about it. Finally, he said, you're wore out, honey. After supper, why don't you go up to bed, get under the covers, and read if you feel like it. Or if you feel sleepy, you should go ahead and sleep. There's nothing else needs to get done today. She made a tired gesture. There's the trap line. I never finished checking the traps. Bud can do it. She didn't say anything to that. She turned from him and walked and looked off towards something in the middle distance. I've seen lightning enough times I don't know why I never thought to worry about it. I never heard of anybody getting struck a second time, so I guess after this you don't have to worry anymore. Don't make a joke, Henry. You didn't see Mary Claudine, the look on her face. He was silent for a while, and then he said, Honey, worrying about it wouldn't have changed anything. There wasn't anything you could have done to keep it from happening. It came right out of a clear sky. He reached for her hand and pulled her to him and held her for a minute. She was stiff in his arms. Her hair, her hair smelled burnt, a smell he knew from years of calf branding. I didn't mean it to be a joke, he said. He rubbed his thumbs along the knobs of her spine and gradually her stiff body loosened and she lowered her head into the bend of his neck and shoulder and wept a few tears. I really loved that horse, she said, which was true, but wasn't what she had opened her mouth to say. No one fell asleep, <laughs> and it was pretty quiet, so I think I feel good. I hope you do. <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know how long this thing is supposed to go on, but um, <laughs> I'm happy to answer anything anybody wants to ask me about my writing life or um, this book or Hearts of Horses or anything else. I'll give you a minute to think up something to ask. I'll ask a question. David. I'm curious if you would just talk uh, a little bit, uh, especially to the students, about origins and evolution and doubt. I don't know very much about Darwin. Uh, no, I'm talking about the, your story, your novel, and if uh, and, and just that you expressed some doubt at the uh, beginning. Mm -hmm. and uh, how uh, that is just a part of writing. Mm, I, I know um, at least one writer who doesn't seem to suffer from doubt, but most writers I know do. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter much how much success you've had in the past. Um, 
I still worry every time that this book will suck. Um, <laughs> and that it will be found out that I actually cannot write and <laughs> that everyone will discover it and look back at my earlier work and see that it, it too was deeply flawed. <laughs> um, and they'll take back all those awards. <laughs> um, so, um, it, I'm a slow, careful writer. Um, I rewrite as I go. Um, it feels to me as if I have to have every sentence perfect before I can move on to the next sentence. And I find that to be a very tedious and difficult way to write, and I wish I didn't write that way. I wish I could write quickly, roughly, and get to the end of a big shape, and then go back and rewrite, which is how many, many writers do it, and I envy that very, very deeply, because it seems like that would be a great way to work. Because I love the rewrite process, but I'm rewriting every single day as I move forward. And so it's a very, very slow way to write a book. And then because, partly because of that, I, can't, I don't really have a draft that I can show to other people and get feedback early on. So this sort of feeds the aspect that you, that you asked me about, which is the worry part of me. Um, so when I read a piece like this, I, I wouldn't have read this piece to you six months ago. The book is very, very close to being done now, and although only really one person has seen much of it at all, um, I'm beginning slowly to feel like, oh, okay, this book is actually going to get written, and, and it's actually not seeming to suck too much. So I'm feeling like, I'm feeling a little more confident enough to read it to an audience. Um, and I wasn't kidding when I said it's a little bit scary. Um, it's a long answer to that question. I'm not sure I actually got at it. But um, those of you who are writers, um, the only way to write is to keep writing. And um, even when you distrust whether what you're working on is any good, you just have to keep at it and um, try to make it better, I guess. That's what I keep trying to do. And um, there were points when I was working on this book where I really knew it was going off the rails, where I really doubted that I had a clear idea of what it, what, why I was writing it and what it was going to say. And so then I had to stop. I had to stop and think a about that and write notes to myself and you know brainstorm with myself about what this book is really about and why I have these doubts about whether it's working. And the one person who's who's seen um, a fair bit of this, Betty Husted, who lives in Pendleton, um, she and I had a long brainstorming telephone conversation about the book, um, trying to figure out why I felt the way I did and what I could do about it. So the one thing I think is very helpful to writers is, is peer critique, is people you trust, whose opinion you trust, to read your work and help you figure out um, what's working and what isn't working in it. I was in a peer critique group for 15 years, and it's, it's probably the most important thing responsible for, my, for any success that I've had. Uh -huh. I'm really curious, you know, being a film major, what got you on the subject of someone traveling to Southern California to be a film uh, course mentor? Mm. His question had to do um, with the film industry and wh where I got the notion to write about a guy going down to, the, to Southern California to work in the movies. Um, I don't think I can trace that back. I'm not really sure where that notion uh, occurred. Um, but I, but I, th I think it followed naturally from, my from the hearts of horses, from my interest in horses and how horses have been used in the past and both treated well and mistreated. And there's a lot of information about that in terms of how horses were used in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in the cowboy movies. And um, uh, I wasn't sure I, I wanted to do this book because it's not a landscape that is my familiar landscape. I'm a fourth generation Oregonian, and I've mostly written about Oregon, Oregon landscapes particularly your side of the mountains, the dry side. Um, 
for whatever reason. I, I feel it's the country of my, of my heart, I guess. Um, but California is not my landscape at all. And it, that was actually probably one of the things that worried me the most when I was early on in this book, writing this book, was not feeling that I knew much about that landscape, but also that I didn't know much at all about the filmmaking industry. So I felt really on shaky ground there. Um, I've gotten over that because I'm an obsessive researcher. And I did uh, spend two weeks in Southern California. Um, and I've talked to lots and lots of people who worked in the stunt writing um, business and the movie business. And it's amazing to me um, when you drive around in Los Angeles today, if you're trying to look at that city through a 1938 lens, how much of it is still exactly the same. It's astonishing. Um, if you can pull away from the freeways, there are vast neighborhoods that are still exactly the way they were in the 30s. And the whole original LA downtown is still exactly the way it was in 1938, completely unchanged. It's astonishing, really. Mm -hmm. Her question is about the early stages of a novel and whether I write an outline or how, how it goes in the early going. Um, I, I tried writing an outline with one of my earlier books and it didn't work because every time somebody turned left instead of right, I wound up rewriting the outline and it was fruit, a fruitless experiment. Um, what has worked for me with every book, once I get a notion as let's just say this, this one, um, you know, a young man who goes to California to work in the, stunt, in the movie business as a stunt writer. So you've got a person and in a situation. And once I get that notion, then I start doing a lot of reading and research around that notion. So I started reading about the stunt writing business and the movie Cowboys and, and LA, and, and I keep notes in a, you know, an eight, eight and a half by 11, notebook, like the ones you probably are taking notes in in your classes. Um, and I, I take notes in there from my research and from my thinking, because I'm thinking about it too. I'm thinking about, OK, what's this guy Bud like? And, and I'm just making all kinds of notes on the same page, which is a very disorganized way to keep notes, because on that page there might be a note about the character. There might be um, a quote I've taken out of a, a text that I was reading. There might be a note about landscape, there might be a note about weather, anything on the same page. And I usually wind up with three or four of these notebooks by the time the book is done. Um, that chaotic way of keeping notes works for me, though, because what happens then is I know that somewhere in one of these notebooks, <laughs> there's, a, there's a note about the, the subway system in Los Angeles but I don't know where it is, so I start looking through my notebooks for it. And then what happens is that I'm rereading my notebooks. And I love that. And it gets me started again, and if I'm stalled, and also I, I'll see something and I'll think, oh, I forgot all about that. Oh, that's great. I'll use that. You know, And so it works for me. Um, I, I can't begin to write the book itself until I have a certain weight of knowledge about both the research aspect and, and who these people are and what they're doing. And then I also usually have to have a list, eight or ten things that I think are going to happen in the novel. And these are sort of plot point kind of things. They're, they're events that, might ha that, that I think are going to happen. Because um, I, I need to feel like there's enough there for an actual novel. Um, not just a, a short story, for instance. Um, and almost always what happens is that a few of those things never do happen. I never do get to them. And then other things happen that weren't on the list. But I start with that list. And it's not in any particular order. So then there's always also the question of what happens first and what happens next. And that gets worked out as I'm writing. But that's how I start. And somewhere along the line, the first sentence occurs to me. And then I'm off and running. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. The question is about whether I read and what, and I guess what I read and how that fits in with the creative part of my life. Um, I think that every writer begins to be a writer by first being a reader. I don't think you can be a writer without being a reader first. And I was a, um, an obsessive reader and an eclectic reader as a kid. Um, started reading early and read everything I could get my hands on. We were poor, so it was always libraries that we went to. I didn't own books, or I owned very few books, but, um, but we went to the library every week. My dad was a, a heavy reader, too, and he always read genre. He always read Western novels, and, um, but he read all the time, and he took us to the library every week. So I read all through my childhood, and some of my obsessions as a childhood reader have made it into my, into my work, because I, too, became a reader of Western novels, and I think that one of the things I'm always trying to do in my novels is to, to, to re-examine, re-imagine the cowboy myth, the myth of the West um, that we all grew up with and that was in the cowboy movies, um, to re-examine and re-imagine that in my fiction in a, in a new way and to put both women and community more at the center of those stories um, that were always occupied by the lone gunslinging cowboy, you know, hero, Shane. Um, Shane. <laughs> Shane. Does that answer? Does that get close? Anything else? Uh huh. I hear it. Um, I hear it. I, I don't know. Um, my, my dad, we were talking at dinner tonight. My dad was from West Texas, and I hear his voice. He grew up in the 20s and thir early 30s. Um, I hear his voice a lot in, when I'm writing dialogue, um, and, and that might be partly where it comes from. I'm not sure. I, it is, yeah. I hear the rhythm of it, and um, yeah, I don't know. How do you create space to write? I mean, you can start by doing. You mean physical own. space or yeah. or and, time? And mental space, and you know, what what's your approach to sitting down and actually getting the words on the mm. page besides the research? The she's asking me about how I find space in my life, I guess, for for writing. Um, that's really an interesting question because um, when I began to write, um, my son was, I began to get serious about writing when my son was in kindergarten and then first grade. And when my son was little, writing was so important to, to me and I had to carve out space for it out of my life as a wife and a mother. And at the time I was trying to be Mother Earth, you know, so I had a big garden and I made my own bread and I made my own soup and, you know, all of that. Um, spent all summer canning fruits and vegetables. When I got serious about writing, I would write, um, it actually started out, uh, I would write four days a week during the school year. I wrote when my son, as soon as my son and my husband were off to work and to school, I sat down to write, well, I put a load in the washing machine, a load the dishwasher, and, you know, and sat down to write. And I wrote and basically through until people came home in the afternoon. So when my son was really little, that might be as early as 2 or 2.30, and then as he got older and had a longer school day, it might be 3.30 or 4. Um, and I wrote first four days a week, and on the fifth day, I tried to do everything else. I cleaned the house, I did the grocery shopping, I made the bread. Well, that went by the by before too long. And I taught myself to ignore the dust bunnies under the furniture. And I started buying the bread. And I did the grocery shopping on the weekend. And whoever thought the toilet was grotiest cleaned it. Um, 
and I wrote five days a week. Um, and I always took weekends off, and I always took summers off, because we were a family that did a lot of hiking and camping, and we were always gearing up to go somewhere or winding down from having been all summer long. Um, so that was my schedule for many, many years. Now my son has grown, my husband died, I live alone, I could write any old time. I could start at 6 in the morning and still be writing at midnight if I wished. I can write on Saturday and Sunday, I can write all summer long, and of course I find it harder and harder to sit down and write. Because I don't have that little window where I know, oh God, I have to write now because this is the only window I have. I don't have that, and so it's harder and harder to make myself shape it. So instead what happens is I have a leisurely breakfast, and I read the morning paper, and I work the Sudoku. <laughs> and then I look at my watch, and it's coming up on 11 o'clock. <laughs> and I say to myself, well, it's almost lunchtime. There's no point in starting yet. <laughs> Um, I'm getting over that. I'm, uh, this book is close enough to done now that I'm really trying to, I'm trying to be much better about it and write every day and write um, longer days and get it finished. So, but it's harder. It's harder now. Do you set goals for yourself, like daily goals, at all? Yes, I do. Um, I try to set goals uh, both word length and, and time wise. Um, they're small though because I am a very slow writer so for me an average day would be 200 words but those are golden words might I say um, <laughs> so a really good day for me I mean a super good day would be 400 words mm -hmm. I, I see on I see on Twitter other writers who say Oh, got 1,500 words, time to quit for a coffee break. And I'm going, I would kill that woman if I knew her. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, sorry, yeah. Do you have to write chronologically, or do you find yourself like writing the ending, sometimes mm -hmm. coming back to the point where you've already been? He's asking me if I, if I write chronologically. I have always written chronologically, always, and I'm not in this book, which is... Um, new for me, very different experience for me. Um, I've actually already written the last chapter. Um, and I, when I did that, I had such a clear idea of it that I, I really felt I had to write it. And, and I worried when I wrote it, actually, because I thought, well, if I write the last one, will I be motivated to fill in the big gap between, you know, that comes, that I've skipped over. Um, but the book also lends itself to moving around in it because of the fact that it has, it deals in different um, chronological periods. There's a period in the 20s and in the early 30s and then the late 30s. And so I've, when I'm stuck on something, I find that it helps me that I can jump to some other part of the book and work on that for a while and then go back to the part that was sticky. Um, so it's been um, a revelation to me, actually, because I never thought I could write anything except chronologically straight through. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall like, the dawning moment you had when you felt you really wanted to be a writer? Did you ever have like, anyone influence you like, or anyone you looked up to? She's asking me when I knew I wanted to be a writer. Was I, Did I have a sudden moment when I realized it. Um, I, don't, I can't point to a particular moment moment. Um, I always loved to write as a little kid, uh, right up from as soon as I could write. I wrote stories. Um, when I got, and I wrote, was writing a lot in high school, and when I got to college, I had a creative writing teacher who stopped me from writing for about three or four years. Um, <coughs> Um, undermine my confidence in my ear, in what I heard in terms of rhythm. This teacher was so rigid in what he expected of his students that it, it undermined my belief in my own rhythm. Um, but then I went back to writing uh, a few years later, and not imagining that I could ever be a writer, because I grew up in an era when, I don't know, no, nobody ever told girls they could be a writer. I mean, I was told I could be a teacher or a nurse, really, literally. Um, 
girls who were smart and wanted to go to college. You could be a teacher, you could be a nurse. And I also grew up in an era when um, books were not as everywhere as they are now, and bookstores were not as everywhere as they are now. So because we went to libraries, all the library books were, in those days, were all rebound in these dark, heavy-duty library covers, you know, dark colors. And so the original cover was gone. And I never saw a book jacket that had, for instance, a photograph of the author and a little bio about the author. I never saw a book like that growing up. And so I, I really, I, I say this only half jokingly, it's really half true, that I kind of thought most authors were dead because they just weren't present on the book, you know? Um, so it just never occurred to me that I could actually grow up and be a writer. Um, but after college, I began to realize, you know, authors weren't dead and, you know, you, you could, in fact, write. And when I began to get really super serious about it was when my son started kindergarten and I heard about a competition for an unpublished writer to write a Western novel. And I had read, by that point, probably 200 of them, and I thought, how hard could that be? Um, and the deadline was six months out, and I knew that I'd have a couple, three hours every day to work because my son would be in kindergarten. And because you don't know that you can't do it, you can't write a novel in six months working two or three hours a day for, for five days a week, and so I did. I wrote a novel in six months, writing two or three hours a day. It was a perfectly awful book. But, um, but I learned a lot by doing it. I think just by the, phys the act of writing every day, I learned an awful lot about writing. Um, and by the time I got to the end of that book, I knew that I wanted to keep doing it. I wanted to write. I wanted to be a writer. So that's not a moment, but a, you know, it's, a, it's a path, I guess, that I got started on. Uh -huh. uh, who are some authors who have influenced you? Um, well, I, I'm an eclectic reader. I've read a lot of stuff. So um, mostly I, I like certain books rather than certain authors, although there are a couple of authors. I've read everything of theirs. I've read all of Willa Cather, for instance. Um, probably she's been an influence on me. Um, I... I've just really loved certain certain books, um, and I, and I don't think they've been influenced. They haven't influenced me. They're just books that I really admire. Um, I think probably the cowboy novels and the and the great literature of the American West. You know, um, A. B. Guthrie Jr., The Big Sky, The Way West, um, The Oxbow Incident, Honey in the Horn. Shane, um, these great novels of the West have been probably more of an influence upon me than anything else, in part because I both loved them and, and, wanted, to, and wanted to write what they weren't telling, which is the story, the other story about the West, the ordinary, the heroism of ordinary people, um, the stories about women and community that are left out of those novels. It's 8.30, should we be? One more? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Everybody I know, every writer I know is uh, confused about it and, and most of them are scared about it. Um, I know that publishers and editors are terrified about it because they don't know whether they're even going to still be a viable business in five or ten years. Um, if everybody's reading ebooks and every, every writer, every amateur writer is publishing their own ebook, does, is, that any, is there going to be any place for the big publishing houses at all? They're very worried about it. Um, most writers I know have no idea what's going to happen, and neither do the publishers and editors. Nobody knows. Uh, you know, I, I really believe that physical books will continue to exist forever, but what percentage of books is going to be occupied by the e-book is the big, big question that nobody knows the answer to. And I also don't know, generational speaking, you know, is the upcoming young, are, are the college students in this room or the high school students, are they going to want to read physical books or are they so used to reading their books on a, on a screen 
is the real book going to disappear? I, nobody really knows the answer to that at this point. I think it, ha it has the potential to have um, good, good outcomes, you know, to make more books by more writers available to readers. But whether readers can find the books they're looking for is another question, because if, if the publishing industry is damaged or disappears, who will do the marketing that will help you to find the books that you might be interested in? I don't know. It's a big question. I think maybe we should, it's 8.30, maybe we should call it a night. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.